one of the things I tell a lot of our uh, younger designers in the firm, and we talk about this all the time as a leadership team and as, as a throughout our offices, is that what we are involved in to help plan and craft is typically the single or one of the most largest capital investments of an individual, a corporation, um, or, or an entity, a team, an institution. So we have to be wise stewards of their capital resources, which can be in the millions, tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions. So you have to make sure that you treat and understand that every dollar you're spending as part of this awesome creative design process it is, is done appropriately, meets their needs, but it also creates beauty in the landscape because we don't want to lose track of that. We want to make sure that what we're giving back to the community as far as a finished building or renovated building, whatever, a stadium or whatever that is, is uh, impacts the community positively in the built environment. And that's, I think, one of the best things as designers we can see is someone trusts us. We work together as a collaboration. We come up with a design solution. We work with awesome contractors and people who build it, who are in many cases geniuses and wonderful people and really talented. And then in the end, you sit back and watch somebody walk in for the first time or start to use it. And it's just an amazing feeling. We're focused on, on making sure that we um, are honest and trustworthy. We have a reputation of trust and integrity, which is number one with our firm. Number two, we're always trying to push the limits to be great design leaders. And so to do wonderful, beautiful projects that have impact regardless of budget. So we want people to come to us as a firm of choice. And I think we've been pretty successful at doing that. And so we have great clients coming to us. And then it's just aligning the people internally to make sure that, you know, the right personality and mix of team aligns well with the client expectations. And we have a great core design, kind of a design leadership group in the firm led by our CEO who really kind of helps with the vision and, and, uh, design vision and design leadership in the project. We have a, a group of amazing project managers and really great design oriented technical architects who we bring alongside to take these beautiful visions and make them beautiful, working, affordable buildings. I grew up in a small town north of Columbus, um, Sparta, Ohio. Shout out to my people in Morrow County. Um, and you know, my parents were, uh, my father was an executive with a restaurant chain and my mother was a stay at home mom, former teacher. Um, and so small town growing up, my dad was kind of regional. So he kind of within a hundred miles went all over North central Ohio, Columbus area, but we would have a great dinner table. Um, both of them had come from good families growing up. And so it was, you know, Americana. I have one older brother who's uh, six and a half years older. So we're almost like two only children, right? He was out when I matured, but we would sit around in the, in the kitchen in a small town in an old farmhouse and do all those great American things. And it's a, it was a, it was a family still is pretty instilled with politics and opinions. Um, you know, my father's from the East coast. He's from a big French Irish Catholic family. My mother's from a Western family. And so they're very uh, active. And so there were always ideas and challenges and, um, you know, a lot of tough conversations and criticisms of politics and society. And that was just part of my growing up from as long as I can remember. No, that's great. And, and had you, so, so you're uh, an architect today uh, and, yes. and do a number of different things. Did you have a uh, tendency, were you interested in architecture as a kid or how things were constructed, built, put together? Uh, were there any, any things like that that you can remember? Oh yeah. I mean, I think like most architects will joke, we all had Lincoln logs as a child. Uh -huh. I mean, I can remember back growing up in the seventies, um, some of my earliest memories in the mid seventies when I was a toddler, I remember Lincoln logs playing um, on my parents' uh, first house in Columbus. I must've been three or four. And then um, as we moved to the country, my parents bought this grand old somewhat run down farmhouse in 1901 that was just full of detail and wood and character. And, you know, we had old barns. It was part of an old farm that they grew up on. So I was always climbing around in old barns from the 1800s in this old house and um, loved Legos, was passionate about it. And so I'm kind of excited to see all my kids into that now, which they are. Mm. Um, and, you know, so I was always interested in it, but I had a, a real passion for music growing up and I had a, was involved with percussion and also piano and all those things. And I remember in junior high, Joe Bell, my junior high and high school art teacher who just retired, um, I, I was a pretty good drawer. And Joe at one point, I think in seventh or eighth grade said, you know what? I think you'd be a good architect. And that just kind of was in the back of my head. And then most teenage processes went through 27 different careers, was going to go in the military, was going to be a marine biologist. 
And then in 1989, Nova, um, nerds would know that, a great PBS yep. documentary series, had this, I was sitting in my, I remember I was sitting in my parents' family room in the old house, you know, surrounded by wood and character. And, and I remember watching this episode called Design Wars. And it was a documentary about the design competition for the Chicago Public Library oh, wow. uh, for the new downtown branch. So it was late 80s. They were leading architects. Helmut Jahn was one. Uh, I'm trying to even remember Frank Gehry's office, uh, Michael Graves, who were kind of big star architects in the 80s and 90s. And I remember watching that going, holy cow, that's what I want to do. So I must have been a junior in high school. Mm -hmm. And so instantly I started applying, you know, through my know, interest in guidance counselors in my small town high school and ended up getting, starting applying for architecture schools. And, and then through the process, this, this crazy school called Ball State sent me an, in, you know, some have a, one of those prospective pamphlets. And the only thing I knew about it was my brother went to Bowling Green. And I remember sitting in the football stadium with my dad going, why does that flag say ball on the other side? He goes, I don't know. It's some college in Illinois or something. And eventually got into the College of Architecture and Planning at Ball State went in and uh, never looked back. So it, it was uh, Joe Bell to this day, and I've told him this, because um, we've done some work follow-up about 10 years ago. We redesigned my high school in my hometown. We oh, built wow. in That's cool. We got the design as a firm, which was awesome. And Joe was instrumental. And you know, Joe Bell is one of those people in my life and those teachers that will always, um, I'll always be grateful for, because he brought me on this path that led to my education, my vocation. I met my wife in architecture school. Mm -hmm. Many of my dearest friends on this earth are still people I met um, at that college in, in Muncie, Indiana. So um, it was Design Wars by Nova. That was it. That's I don't know fantastic. what happened, man. It just, <laughs> just kicked. And it it's, it's, it's an awesome profession. It's an awesome career. And it's so diverse. And you can go so many different paths with it. Um, but, you know, I would encourage people. And I tell people. And I tell my kids. I'm like, be open. Be excited. You never know when one comment, one phrase, one teacher, mentor, friend is going to say something that's going to affect your path for your entire life. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's always those inspirational, no matter what it is. So, so you were probably looking at the time for something that, you know, what is it that I'm going to do? And, and that just, you know, that struck you. I've, I, I know for me personally, I've, I've done that many times. I'm trying to think of a name or trying to think of a, a problem to, uh, uh, you know, a solution to some type of a problem. And, you know, you just keep rolling around with that in the back of your head and then it all of a sudden just hits you and, you know, it's, it's magic. What, what types magic. of things, what, what types of things were you drawing uh, for that Joe uh, said, you know, I think you'd be a good, a good architect. What, what was, you know, <laughs> I wish I would have kept those pictures. I remember, I, I, and it's funny you bring this up. I remember the drawing and uh, I remember the room because it's still an art room. We renovated it, you know, 20 some years later and it's now an elementary school art room. Um, but I was doing some sort of a forced perspective of a house. You know, if you remember every kid in junior high and high school art class does those constructed mm -hmm. perspectives. And I, I can see the picture. It was like a forced perspective with a house and a road. There's probably some cactuses or some trees on it. I think there were some plants on it, but I remember working on that and I think I was into it and I may have done a couple of them and done a nice job, but I remember Joe to this moment telling me that. Um, and so it's just, you know, one of those funny instances of life, it's just something clicks, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's great. That's great. Uh, so, so talk a little bit about what some of the surprises were that you, that you ran into maybe through schooling, um, things that, you know, maybe you, you didn't really think uh, sh should have been or, or would have been something that you would have been working on or, or applying yourself toward uh, when you're studying architecture. Does anything come to mind as, as far as you know, what's, what's really interesting is fundamentally architecture as a profession. In, you know, engineering is similar, and you know, interior design and graphic design is it's fundamentally problem solving. Um, at, at its base level, you have a problem. And in our world, it usually involves a, a modification or a change or a new built environment. And so I remember that was the surprise to me when I first started architecture school. Um, it's a five-year bachelor's program that I went through. I'm um, a professional degree versus a master's or a doctorate because um, part of it was I just needed to get through as fast as I could because I wanted to be an architect. And, you know, my parents instilled in me, college is expensive. You better figure out a way to pay for it and get through. But I remember the first year we did very little architecture. Hmm. It was all about problem solving. It was analyzing form and shape and space. It was not necessarily coming up with the right solution, but coming up with multiple options to the 
to, to bring solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something if I could go back to my teen self, you know, to be a little more open uh, to listening and self-criticism at that time, because they, they break you down in design school. And this is across most design disciplines. Um, it's kind of based on the Beaux-Arts tradition. They break you down to change your way of thinking, to always look at options and to break down the problem at its fundamental essences and come up with different pathways to possible solutions. So, so you test, it's almost a bit of a scientific method. Mm -hmm. But to me, that was the biggest thing is that no matter what the response is, you know, whether it's, you know, my career, I've been blessed to deal with a lot of different project types, whether it's a renovation of a historic building, whether it's a stadium, whether it's a rec center, a, a house of worship or a, a house, um, there's, a thousand different ways to get to the answer, but you have to really analyze the problem specific to each condition or situation or client. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I love about the profession, but I didn't know I loved it back then. You know, I wanted to design cool buildings and make a name for myself. And that's not what it's all about. It's about engaging with those who have issues and problems and trust you to come up with solutions and then work as a team, a collective team with a bunch of great design professionals and consultants and engineers and and advocates and clients to come up with the right solution. You know, that, that secret sauce, you know, to get into your podcast, you know, there's, there's a whole different series of influences that ultimately when you see a built manifestation, whether it's renovation, new construction, whatever that is, it's the result of that secret sauce of everybody collectively working together. And second, I would say is that it's not an individual profession. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of a disconnect in many schools and institutions, and we as a profession are trying to change it. But Historically, it was all about the me architect, the star architect you may have heard, where we as a profession were taught to focus on ourselves and our ideas, which is important. But I think understanding that when you come out of college as a design professional, whether you're an architect or one of the other allied disciplines, it goes from me to we. The moment you graduate and you enter the workforce, you recognize, wait a minute. First of all, I'm young. I'm out of school. I'm probably not very... Uh, the most productive or biggest asset to my new employer because it's a continued education. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, I'm here collaborating with a bunch of peers at my firm, regardless of the size. And then I need to go out and reach out to the public or get engaged with the community or the clients and have them trust us and our team and develop, we together, a design solution that fits their budget, mm -hmm. um, that meets their goals, and frankly, is wise stewards of their financial resources. One of the things I tell a lot of our uh, younger designers in the firm, and we talk about this all the time as a leadership team and as, as a, throughout our offices, is that what we are involved in to help plan and craft is typically the single or one of the most largest capital investments of an individual, a corporation, um, or, or an entity, a team, an institution. So we have to be wise stewards of their capital resources, which can be in the millions, tens of millions, in some cases, hundreds of millions. So you have to make sure that you treat and understand that every dollar you're spending as part of this awesome creative design process is, is done appropriately, meets their needs, but it also creates beauty in the landscape because we don't want to lose track of that. We want to make sure that what we're giving back to the community as far as a finished building or a renovated building, whatever, a stadium or whatever that is, is... Uh, impacts the community positively in the built environment. And that's, I think, one of the best things as designers we can see is someone trusts us. We work together as a collaboration. We come up with a design solution. We work with awesome contractors and people who build it, who are in many cases geniuses and wonderful people and really talented. And then in the end, you sit back and watch somebody walk in for the first time or start to use it. And it's just an amazing feeling. Oh, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. You you mentioned you kind of alluded to this a, a couple of different times. Um, do you have any type of frameworks or anything like that that you apply when you approach a problem? Um, you, you mentioned that you know this is something that you sort of learned uh, that first year in college where you're you know de deconstructing shapes. I don't know if they had any type of frameworks maybe that they taught you back then or things that you've applied you know in your own career to to be able to again, look at things, you know, differently, as you're saying, or, or find those different solutions to the situation? Well, I think, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting approach. And, and there's various paths, or and I'm sure different, different design schools or different design theory processes kind of have different names and different architectural firms and design firms do it differently. But fundamentally, I think it starts with number one, you have to sit back and listen. 
You have to listen to the needs. You have to analyze the existing condition or conditions. What are they? Okay, so what are the needs? So Matt, say you and I were working together on a, a project. And you know, the first thing we would do is we wouldn't put pencil to paper. We, we would just sit down and have you tell us what's your vision, what's your dream, what's your needs, what's your goal. Mm -hmm. So we want to document that process to make sure we understand where do you want to go at the end of this process. Um, and then we start to analyze the existing conditions, the shapes, the site, the building, whatever that is. And so we start to understand. So we listen, we understand the current situation, the current status of things. You know, where are we today? And then we begin to go through a, a fairly complex process is, you know, identify, um, obviously, from a technical perspective, we need to understand what your investment intention, you know, what is your budget? You know, what are you thinking? Do you know what your budget is? You know, what, what's the priority of that? And then at that point, we begin to dive into, depending on the size of your organization, if it's an individual, it's very easy to kind of work with our team, with you collectively to come up with options, analyze those options. Here's some ideas based on your needs. What do you think? So we analyze those options. We work through iterations and tease different variations to get it closer to a path. We always check back with budgets and finances. And then at the same time, we also want to make sure that there's a, a positive aesthetic impact, right? That these are beautiful solutions, attractive solutions. You know, we just don't want to throw boxes on a landscape. Mm -hmm. I think um, we want to make sure that whatever we do has inherent beauty, has inherent functionality, um, is financially um, feasible, and also um, has a bit of a, a warmth or a wow factor to you and is worthy of your investment and, and your, um, uh, your, uh, it meets your goals. And so it's, it's listen, it's, you know, analyze, it's develop options and options analysis. And then that generally what we found is it's kind of like a funnel. If you, if you think of, we start out here in, in the end of the world, we have a huge funnel and we put in all the, you know, we listen, we look at the existing conditions, we do this options analysis, we come through and the funnel slowly come to a final preferred design solution. It's aesthetically wonderful. It meets all of your functions and programs. Whether it's renovation or new, it, it meets all those criteria. And then it gets us to that, you know, that secret sauce, to go back to your term. It gets us to that preferred design solution that then we help partner with people who build it because we don't build it. We design it and we help create the vision, but then we work with people who build it and implement it together with you to, to get it to that opening point or get it to that completed project, which is um, it's just a fun thing to do. And sometimes that takes months sometimes it takes years and so yeah. it's it's a bit of a journey patience is required sometimes things start and then they go on pause and then they come back a year or two later and then they go on pause so it's kind of a, a, now that i'm a parent i kind of equate it to um, raising kids you know you start at one point and sometimes the journey goes all over the place right and then it gets you to in the end each incremental milestone whether it's a completed building or it's a finished renovation or whether it's just seeing um you know, whether it's seeing life moments happen in a space you were instrumental in designing, which to me is a, is a big, um, is kind of a wonderful thing to see, whether it's, you know, a house of worship, a school, a stadium, where you see these life moments and memories where people um, remember that you, and you can know, hey, I helped create that space. I helped, I was one of a team who helped develop the design of that um, place where somebody got married or somebody buried somebody they loved or, um, or somebody had their first performance at a high school musical or uh, a college player kicked a goal that led to an NCAA championship. And so um, I think, is that, does that answer it? I know I went on it, a little bit. It does. Bit. It does. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank God you can edit well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, uh, you, you touched on leadership a couple of times as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, obviously you, you sort of drew the, uh, the picture for us of you're taking all of this and, and um, you know, putting all of this information into a funnel and it you know, sort of distills down into the essence, if you will, the secret sauce of, you know, what, what it is that that team is really uh, looking for. So throughout that process, obviously, you know, you, you not only have your own staff uh, that you're leading, you know, with that, but I'm sure there's, you know, uh, government influence, city influence, uh, you know, different organizations, neighbors, all of those different types of influences. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you've learned along the way about navigating and leading, you know, situations like that? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I've had, I've been blessed in my career. Um, you know, I went to college in Indiana, 
I've worked a little bit in North Carolina, Cincinnati for a number of years and been out West for a few years. And I've, uh, you know, I've been mentored and taught by just some amazing architects, designers, um, and really core leaders as people. Um, you know, some of them, you know, God rest their soul have passed on. I'm getting, I guess, again, to that point where some of my early mentors, even, even the guys I worked for part-time in college, you just used to, you know, I, I look back, haze me in a fun way, but just, you know, uh, but I learned from them, um, including our, um, you know, our current leadership team in our firm, you know, our, our CEO, Mike Schuster, who's a dear friend and, and just a phenomenal leader. And that's become more evident, you know, as we navigate this kind of crazy time and um, Steve Langkamp and then Keith Hall and many other principals in our firm. But what I've learned is um, from all of them is that I think you, you, you look at the problem, you, you understand the client. First of all, you have to get to know your client. You know, who is this client? Are they a repeat client? Do we know them well? Is it a new client? Um, you know, what is their personality? And I think for us, for a project to be successful, you know, we're a bigger firm. We have 57 employees, three offices. Um, you know, most of our, you know, we're headquartered here in Cincinnati with a branch in Columbus and also in Florida. Um, but looking at the team you have, and so look at the client, try to really understand, get to know the client, and whether we do an existing client or get to know them, especially if it's a new client, we spend extra time getting to know their personality, their leadership structure. And then look at your team, and, and if you know them well, um, try to put the right pieces of the puzzle in place. You know, some, some clients may be somebody who really needs constant daily contact and attention. And, you know, that may not be the right mix for, some, uh, for a project manager or principal in our firm who may be more of a, more of a calm, you know, not necessarily a driven person. So what we try to do is, 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 and we have people of all different types and personality. They're amazing. We've put together an incredible group of people over the past you know, the firm is 35 years old and we have a good solid core. We've been there for 20 plus years, several of them. And we try to align um, personalities of, of project leadership with the client. We also try to um, differentiate ourselves as a firm to not be a commodity based firm. You know, there are firms that just kind of roll out projects based on, Hey, we're the lowest and the cheapest. Um, we're not focused on that. We're focused on, on making sure that we, um, are honest and trustworthy. We have a reputation of trust and integrity, which is number one with our firm. Number two, we're always trying to push the limits to be great design leaders. And so to do wonderful, beautiful projects that have impact regardless of budget. So we want people to come to us as a firm of choice. And I think we've been pretty successful at doing that. And so we have great clients coming to us. And then it's just aligning the people internally to make sure that, you know, the right personality and mix of team aligns well with the client expectations. And we have a great core design kind of a design leadership group in the firm led by our CEO who really kind of helps with the vision and, and uh, design vision and design leadership in the project. We have a, a group of amazing project managers and really great design oriented technical architects who we bring alongside to take these beautiful visions and make them beautiful working affordable buildings. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really looking at your, looking at your bench to go back to a, right. Every, you know, I'm a sports guy. You're from Northeast Ohio, so I know you're a sports mm -hmm. guy too. Yeah, you know, yep. I grew up a Brownies fan. <laughs> One of these years. <laughs> oh, that's all right. I, I root for the Bengals as well now. Yeah, so, you, you know, what can you do? We're Ohio people. We get yep. it. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, I think you look at your bench, you look at the game situation, which is the client and the project and the need. And then I think you start the right lineup and it varies by, it varies by situation and client. Um, and so I think for us, having a diverse range of personalities, viewpoints, and people helps align that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I've been, I'm proud that we have, a as a team, been able to assemble, um, especially for the Midwest, we've been able to dis assemble a pretty diverse um, in thought and personality group of, of uh, professionals in our firm. And that way that helps us be better firm and, and respond to each client's unique needs. Looking at the bench, looking at the game situation and getting the right lineup in there to, to respond well. Makes perfect um, and sense. I think the kind of people, the kind of people that we hire, it's interesting. I've been involved in the, um, one of the key people we help kind of screen potential test staff and team members. And what we tell people is that um, we are not a firm for people. Uh, we are a firm where you need to call an audible. You have to be flexible and nimble in our practice. Mm -hmm. um, and that means be willing to do whatever it is, roll up your sleeves. You know, maybe it's because we're Midwesterners at heart, you know, we're in the middle of the country here where we just, you know, you're from Ohio, you get it. We just get it done, yep. put our head yeah. down and make it happen. But 
I think we want people to be creative, unique, but we also want them to be flexible. And so we are the kind of firm uh, in team, which is entrepreneurial. So we tell people, if you see a problem, you see an idea, you see a creative design solution, go find it. Yeah, bring it to the table. I mean, we have groups of people exploring prefabrication offsite for design elements so we can, number one, we can lower construction time. Number two, minimize the number of people in contact in the field. So to help with our current pandemic. And so for us, it's really creativity, being nimble and being entrepreneurial. We have found has made the most successful um, team within our profession, which is architecture, interior design, and graphic design. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, there, there always seems to be a favorite memorable project, something that absolutely stands out, you know, when you, when you think back, like, wow, you know, we did that. What, what, what is that project for you? Um, for me personally, there, there's, I would, I mean, there's, there's so many, I mean, I look back, <laughs> I've been blessed. I've been doing this 20, 25, you know, 25 yeah. <laughs> years, um, post-college. Um, there's probably two, I mean, uh, and by saying this, I might upset some of my clients, but you know, that's okay. I think they get it. I mean, there's, there's probably a 10 to 20 that are really special, but there's probably two for me. This is just Bill, not the firm. Mm -hmm. um, number one was when in the late 2000s, about 12 years ago, we were hired to design the new high school for my hometown. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was, it's a very traditional um, Morrow County, Ohio. It's halfway between Columbus and Mansfield up your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. A very traditional, very conservative place. Um, you know, I grew up there. It taught me the values of hard work, honoring your word. You know, a handshake was business. You know, handshake was your word. Um, you followed through, you worked hard, um, and you were, you know, kind of more self-reliant. And so uh, the building is very traditional on the outside. It's a beautiful building. It's timeless. You know, when they, when they hired us, one of the school board members who was a, a former high school classmate pulled me aside. He goes, you know what? Because you know what the outside of this building needs to be. It needs to be brick, stone, sloped metal roofs. Um, you can do, you guys can have some fun with the inside, but you understand what we want. And I said, absolutely. But the, the spaces, you know, we were in, we went to a 1960s building, which is now a middle school, which we mm -hmm. renovated. But knowing what the, in, you know, the, I had a great childhood, a great community to grow up in and all the memories for me. But as I said earlier, the ability to be able to be part of a team, and it was not me, it was a group of probably, really in the end, 40 to 50 architects, engineers, interior designers across many firms who did the work. Mm -hmm. But to be able to have influence on the shapes and the spaces that would create memories for the next generation of kids, which they're living in now, for me was really special. And then to go to the dedication, um, and my parents could go, my parents are still living, I'm very blessed. They were able to go back to the tent. They've moved away, but were able to go back and see a lot of friends. And then my oldest daughter was, uh, my twins were not born yet, but my oldest daughter was a toddler. And so my wife, my oldest daughter, and my parents were able to be there when we dedicated the new building. And so for me, it was from a more of a sentimentality piece as an architect to kind of walk through the hallways. Um, many of my home, you know, it's a small town, people generally stay in the region. And so high school classmates are now faculty, you know, the guidance counselor was an old friend of mine, she's still there. Um, to kind of walk around the building with all of them and see the new space that I was just, you know, a small part of was pretty exciting. And it, it, it's one that will, you know, at the end of my career, whenever I decide to retire, if I do, um, you know, I'll look back at that project as a special moment to be able to just be a part of that community. And we've done work since we renovated the football stadium, you know, I was a track athlete. So, you know, all those spaces that were instrumental to me, our firm and team has been able to touch and improve. And then they've got a beautiful campus and it's a great school district. And, I tell anybody, if you want to live outside of Columbus, move to Highland Schools. It's a great place to grow up and raise your kids. Um, the other one is a more recent project. We just finished it. Um, I'm a sports guy, as I mentioned. Grew up as a Browns fan. Still have a little sentimental heart. I'm a Bengals fan now. I root for my Ball State Cardinals when, when they – I like to root for them. They aren't doing too well lately, but they'll be all right. They'll do better. <laughs> but uh, we just uh, – I love soccer. I love football. I love baseball. My wife's a Reds maniac. You know, we Bengals fan. But I also love soccer. So we, as a firm, um, have been with FC Cincinnati, which is the newest major league soccer team, through some relationships and connections with Mike Schuster, our president. In the club, we had been advising the club since their start. Um, we helped them work through. We were kind of the local firm helping them with owner's rep advising, stadium site location. We helped them put together their major league soccer bid. They got into major league soccer. It was really exciting. We helped them kind of plan for stadium siting. 
Um, and then as part of that, they awarded us the uh, design, uh, the design of their new uh, Mercy Health Training Center, which just came online um, last fall. You know, used it for a month and it's been in quarantine now and they're getting ready to ramp it back up. But to be a part of a club, a professional club from its infancy when it was not even a minor league team and advise the club and become close with staff and members and and then to get to work on as an architect, which is our practice, is in our sports practice, really focuses on athlete-focused training um, prep areas. Yes, we do some stadium work. We do a lot of hospitality work and retrofits of big stadiums. But our the bailiwick of our sports practice is a lot of athlete-centric kind of training. And so to work on that training center, um, which has been hailed as the best soccer training facility in the Western Hemisphere, wow. it just came on and was really exciting to walk through. Um, with the ownership, several of the owners of the team, as you can imagine, if you own a major league soccer team, mm-hmm. very fluent, very uh, wonderful family, the Lindner family and the Joseph family, and there's several others. But to have members of those families come up and say, thank you, this is a beautiful building. It's what we meant. Um, it's what we wanted. And then the club leadership, Jeff Birding, and everybody else has been like, we love it. It's a wonderful building. But just to have, to be given the opportunity to work with them on creating something that's never been created in this region. Mm-hmm. And then to have it come through, we had great building partners at Turner Construction who were just uh, amazing partnership and all of our team members. But it was a project of from initial design through execution was just a seamless team. And it was a positive team. There was, there was no negativity because sometimes in construction, as you can imagine, things go awry. Yeah. And so, um, but it was just, it was one of these projects where I know I will look back and say it was an awesome client. It was a, a joyous process to design it. It's a beautiful site, and we have grateful owners, um, and the team loves it. You know, the players have been in it. The staff has been in it. And so the, the Mercy Health Training Center for FC Cincinnati is probably um, up there, you know, has uh, been probably the most memorable. And then just all of our internal workings as a team, our internal team with Mike and Joe and Caitlin and um, Tricia, and there's a whole number of people like mentioned in the firm who've been a part of it. It's just been fun. And everybody was excited to be a part of it because it was such a new project type. And so it's, you know, getting out there in the press a bit and uh, just to see it being used too, to see a clip a few times when the players are out there was pretty cool. You know, you see a building, you step back and you watch it getting used. You know, for us, that is, you know, that's the secret sauce for an architect seeing a building. Um, And then the third one, uh, I'll just throw another third one in there and you can you can choose to cut it out if you want that. But it was a project we did about 16 years ago. And since it's been torn down, actually, because FC Cincinnati put a stadium on top of it and they okay. moved it. But we did, we were hired by Cincinnati Public Schools to do a bunch of stadiums. Um, you know, it was a historically poor urban district that had disinvested in its facilities and um, had a past a levy. And, and we were hired to do a bunch of athletic projects for the district. Um, one of them was a new stadium in downtown called Stargill Stadium for Taft High School. Um, Taft was a historically um, uh, poor urban inner city population, had been going through a bit of a resurgence. Academically, they had kind of come out of the, you know, come out of the morass and were doing well. And then the district gave them a brand new uh, multipurpose kind of central football stadium for the Taft Senators, but also for the district. Mm-hmm. And it was a crazy timeline. It got done. But to watch the Taft Senator football team run out on opening night, because it was right behind the high school in the middle of a neighborhood. I mean, there's a soccer stadium getting built there now. They ended up moving it across the street. But to see these kids who've never had anything. I mean, this is a beautiful stadium, probably one of the nicest high school stadiums we've ever done. Um, Something that would have lasted 50 years, but they just built a new one across the street Mm -hmm. and put a soccer stadium on top of it. But to see the kids run out on that field, Um, There are a couple of our team members who are actually crying because these kids had never, I mean, this is nicer than any suburban high school or wealthy private school stadium, but to see them run on the field for that first night and they won, it was pretty cool. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so what's next, what's next for, for MSA design? You know, we, um, you know, we, you know, I, I joke, you know, we, as a firm, like I say, we want to be a design leader. We want to walk with integrity and do great, bit, you know, do good business with integrity, treat our people fairly with integrity, um, and just do good work. You know, we have not, um, in this testament to our leadership, Mike and others, myself and our entire team, we have not 
you know, we're Midwesterners, right? We're just, the, we're the people in the middle of the country who just do good work and try to you know, treat our clients fairly and make a difference. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've been able to grow our firm to, you know, 57 people. Um, we're, you know, we are working through this pandemic in, you know, with open, you know, with openness and, and honesty with our staff and we're faring pretty well. Um, but for us, it's really to become, you know, I, I joke in our sports practice, we have our overall firm and then all of our sports work comes under MSA Sport, which is an internal division that's really more of a studio, um, but most of the people in the firm work on sport projects at one point or another. You know, I always ask the question right now, you know, I always ask the question, why can't Ohio and the Midwest be the center of American sports architecture? Why not? There's nothing wrong with us. Um, we're close to everything. Um, right now, the center of that sports architecture is on the coasts, you know, L.A., um, New York, some Philadelphia, and then certainly Kansas City is the epicenter at this point because there's a lot of practices and they're great people and great firms and many friends who work with all of these. But I say, why can't we, why can't Cincinnati, Columbus, you know, Ohio, and then obviously our, our branch in Florida, why can't we be uh, a national leader in design, regardless of what kind of market it is, you know, whether it's civic work, you know, uh, commercial work, corporate work, whether it's our sports work or whether it's, you know, uh, houses of worship or you know, why can't we be a center of design excellence? And that's really what we strive to do is design excellence, walk with integrity, and treat our clients and our people fairly. And I think, you know, you, you get out of life what you put into it. And I think, um, you know, the golden rule, right, Matt? Do unto others. And so we just try to, every day, make sure that we're making a difference in the communities we serve. We're trying to make a difference with our clients. We're trying to, you know, make a difference and be positive with our, with our teams and our people. And I think that's, that's everything to us. That's great. That's great. If, if people wanted to get in touch with you, learn more about MSA design, what, what you guys do, what would you suggest the best way to, to do that would be? Well, probably, uh, number one, go to our website, www.msaarch.com. And then obviously you can on there, you can have our contact information or you can email me directly. I know you'll probably have my email contact information, but email me directly and, you know, we'll get you in touch with the appropriate person in the firm. Um, Cause what we, like I say, we try to do is get to know people, get to know their, you know, their needs and wishes and wants, and then, you know, bring our team to the table. That's the best fit for them. I love it. I love it. Yeah. No, this has been fantastic. Uh, Bill, thank you for uh, being on the show. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing uh, MSA design, some, some new designs from you guys. Um, I, I'm going to look up the, uh, the stadium and, and that, that, uh, that you guys just designed. So uh, I've always been, I've always had a big passion for, uh, for architecture and, and uh, pleasing design myself. So certainly can appreciate when, uh, when projects come together. That, uh, awesome. That's great. So, but again, I appreciate it and uh, we will be in touch soon. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it.